Hello, welcome to The Elephant. I'm Kevin Canners. This week on The Elephant, we're joined by climate scientist Professor John Schellenhuber. My name is John Schellenhuber. I'm a physicist and I'm here based in Potsdam. Professor Schellenhuber is the director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. It's one of the leading research institutes in the world working on climate change. And his expertise is in high demand. Not only has he been for years an advisor to the German government on climate matters, he also consulted on the summer's encyclical. You might have heard of it. It's the document that the Catholic Church and Pope Francis put out this year, calling for swift and unified global action on climate change, adding a moral dimension to what has been mostly been thought of as a scientific problem. Professor Schellenhuber's native language is German. Okay, nice to meet you. So we speak in English, I guess, sir? Yeah. Uh, for your benefit. Yeah. I traveled down to Potsdam recently to speak with Professor Schellenhuber at his office. I have to get used to your Canadian accent, actually. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Once we sorted out the accents, I started by asking Professor Schellenhuber about his thoughts on where the world is currently at in terms of dealing with the climate problem. And if he was surprised about the progress or lack thereof that's been made. No, uh, that is a, a very interesting question. Of course, you wonder where are we now and uh, could we have gone further or are we still lucky that we are where we are right now? And uh, given all in all, I think we are precisely where we deserve to be. Yeah? <laughs> I actually entered the, the, the science of climate change, uh, having been trained as a physicist and mathematician around 1990. And uh, so I've seen a fantastic advancement of the science of climate change. You know, this is the office where Einstein's field equations were solved for the first time, 1916 actually. And in a sense, I feel now some hundred years later, we are also at the frontier of a new science emerging, understanding the Earth system and so on. So that has been extremely gratifying. When I look to the process of really solving the problem or addressing the problem properly, yeah, what I really have learned is how complicated uh, human nature is and how much in the end really it matters what values you have and what moral convictions you have. So what I'm saying is we got the science right in a sense. We have the economics pretty okay now. We understand how institutions work. But I think we have neglected human nature really. Yeah? And this year I really learned through my involvement in the encyclical, in the end people have to make a moral decision. Yeah? When it really comes to important things, yeah? whether you fall in love with someone, if you raise children... Yeah? whether you make an investment, whether you vote for a party, whatever you do, whether you try to help refugees, uh, it is a moral decision you have to make. And I think climate change ultimately is a moral issue. And that's what we finally have come to understand. So, so why is climate change a moral question? I coined this phrase, the dictatorship of now. In a sense, you, this generation... Uh, People of my age, not your age, but uh, I'm 65, uh, people who are 50, 60, 70, run the world these days. Uh, it's in principle elderly men, of course. And uh, we benefit from exploiting the past, you know, the, like fossil fuels, resources which were created by nature over millions of years. They are exploited now within a generation or two generations. So we actually withhold these resources from future generations. But on top of them, we also leave all our waste to these future generations. CO2, radioactive uh, waste and so on. It's crazy. So we use the resources of the past, but we put all the burden on future generations. This is just not fair, really. I'm not even talking about rich and poor countries, eh? because who benefits from the current industrial metabolism? It's a tiny part of population. So I think it is just not fair how we use, make use of the planet. It is not fair in terms of intra-generational and in terms of intergenerational equity and fairness. 
So you could now say, and what is the moral choice here? Huh? I could say, okay, I'm well to do. Huh? My life is more or less over, so let's have a good time uh, the next 10 years if everything is okay. So that's it, and bad luck for the others. Uh? But when you say to yourself, this is not okay, uh? not even for myself, I do not feel okay with that. For my own benefit, I make the moral decision that we have to change the course and that we have to give future generations a fair chance. I think it's your generation, the young people, who have a dual reason for really asking about this. I mean, on the one hand, you will have to make the moral decision yourself, but you also will be much more impacted by the things my generation is neglecting to do. So you should be very angry about the situation. So whenever I talk to young people, I say, show your angriness, uh, show your anger, show that this is not okay, yeah? that you are deprived from many options in the future, which my generation had. As I mentioned at the beginning, Professor Sheldon Huber played a crucial role in the Pope's encyclical on climate change. Not only was he the principal scientific advisor on it, he was also one of the three key people chosen to present the encyclical at a news conference that took place at the Vatican on the day that it was released. And his work with the Vatican doesn't end there. Earlier this year, Professor Sheldon Huber was appointed to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, a scientific body of the Vatican itself. And while, of course, the Vatican and science haven't always had the best of relationships, today the Pontifical Academy is actually one of the most elite scientific bodies in the world. The body is limited to 80 people, who are appointed for life, and it counts some of the world's most renowned scientists among its members, including Stephen Hawking and many Nobel Prize winners. I asked Professor Sheldon Herbert about how he got involved with the encyclical in the first place, and what it was like working with Pope Francis. Yeah, and I cannot disclose the full story of all. Many people are interested in that. I mean, maybe in 50 years, one will know precisely who made uh, an input and so on. I mean, I had to play a role, but this encyclical was really written in Spanish by Pope Francis. Uh, I mean, this was so near and dear to his heart that he said, this is my document, so to speak, of course. Initial drafts were circulated. In the end, he, he took a week and, and just wrote it down. It's a beautiful document, by the way. Now, the Vatican has long debated, for many years, debated about global warming. And I did not take part in that, but some 10 years ago, there was a symposium on global warming, which was more or less dominated by climate skeptics and denialists. I think Fred Singer was there and all these people, so the usual suspects. But uh, over the years, and of course when Pope Francis came into office, things have changed really. So the Vatican decided that they want to take the scientific evidence absolutely seriously. And so in 2011 there was a very interesting uh, workshop on mountain glaciers and global warming where I gave a keynote. And this obviously left a big impression, so I was re-invited, and in 2014, last year, there was a, a very important workshop on uh, sustainable nature, sustainable humanity, which set the tone already. Yeah? And when there was a meeting with the Pope, uh, the results of the symposium were presented, and I happened to always be the keynote speaker on climate change. And so when I was somehow drawn into this process, uh, and when Actually, I received an email out of the blue. Uh, the email simply said, we will present the encyclical to the world on the 18th of June. Would you be willing to present it as a scientist, as the only scientist, with a PowerPoint presentation? <laughs> uh, and said, oh my God, the first PowerPoint in the Vatican in 2000 years. Uh, but I'm happy to do that. And they really gave me the forum. So I presented encyclical together with Cardinal Turkson. And afterwards, we had a, a long conversation with Pope Francis, who sort of thanked us. And uh, we had exchanged thoughts about Paris and everything. It was extremely touching and extremely impressive because he's a 
a very charismatic personality. Yeah? So that happened out of the blue, if you like, but I guess it's really based on my scientific input and the role of the Pontifical Academy. And, and this in the end is very gratifying yeah? because I gave an interview on that day in Rome for CNN together with Cardinal Turks and then they more or less said the summary is here on this day, on this very day, uh, faith and reason come together. And I think both in encyclical and in the way it was presented, faith and reason really came together. And faith and reason tell you, <laughs> I mean reason tells you we have a terrible problem, but, but the faith tells us if we just adhere to the principle of humanity, then we also know what we have to do and how we can actually still save the world. So in a, in a way, on that very day in June, everything came together for me and for others. Was there anything that particularly struck you about how, how the Pope or the Vatican more generally has approached this problem? Mm. Uh, I mean, the first thing really is that strictly, everything was strictly based on scientific evidence. Yeah? So it was not cherry picking, you know, here is a very conservative uh, position and it's all in a haze of uncertainty and so on. We simply said in a very sober way, here's the evidence, here are the leading uh, scientists, uh, here are the papers that were published. Based on that, we make the conclusion humanity is responsible for that. Uh, and uh, so that was the one thing. Uh, it was striking how strictly the Vatican adhered uh, to, to scientific evidence. The other thing is that this is a very bold document. Uh, if you read parts of it, you see it's such a clear statement. It says, our current way of life is wrong. Our wasteful way of life is not in line with our care for the common house of humanity, nature, our fellow creatures and so on. Uh, we just got it wrong, actually. Yeah? And it's that such a clear statement. And even saying maybe market capitalism may not uh, be able to solve it. Yeah? So the, the boldness, if you like, and the clarity of the document is striking, I have to say. Yeah? So when I first read the Spanish uh, draft, I said, oh my god, <laughs> in the true sense of the word. Yeah? Uh, well, I heard you mention somewhere it's quite telling when uh, an institution as conservative as the Vatican is saying we need radical change. Yeah, in a sense, we can now declare <laughs> victory, uh, if you like. No, because this year you have this choir, as I said, uh, so many voices are joining from uh, communities, from cities, uh, from business, of course, many nation states now. So we see very encouraging voices all over the place. but. Uh, by construction conservative institution like the Vatican, if they actually raise their voice and they are even one of the most courageous voices eh, and the most demanding and challenging voices of all, then this really means, my God, we have to move. <laughs> get, let's get rolling. Eh? In addition to being in the news recently because of his work on the encyclical, Schellnuber is also renowned within climate circles for another reason. And that has to do with the number two, or two degrees. The amount of warming that most of the world has now agreed represents a red line, a point that cannot be passed without serious consequences. It's a number that we've talked about on this program before, and it's a simple way of thinking about a complex system. As Schellnuber says, what is the global warming problem all about? It is about avoiding impacts, consequences, which we cannot manage anymore. If the Antarctic ice sheet melts down, 50 meter sea level rise, we cannot manage that. So what would be a global metric, if you like, which would, in a sense, encompass the most severe impacts we want to avoid? And that's what the two degree target represents, what we need to stay under to avoid the most serious impacts of climate change. It's based on research, which shows that if we go beyond two degrees of warming, many of the Earth's planetary systems will be tipped into a new state. In our conversation with Elizabeth Colbert from a few episodes ago, we already mentioned one of those tipping points. 
by 1.5 degrees of warming, the planet will lose the vast majority of its coral reefs as ocean acidification takes effect. Then at 2 degrees, there's an additional cluster of dangerous tipping points that we'll need to avoid. So the 2 degree target is critical. It's one that Sheldon Hooper played a key role in defining. He first put it forward as a potential red line back in the 90s. And at the time, he was an advisor to then German environmental minister, now Chancellor, Angela Merkel. He tells us how it evolved from there. So I proposed this, so my colleagues accepted this and said this is an interesting concept. And I discussed it with Angela Merkel, eh, who was German environment minister at the time, and didn't make much impact. But somehow, you know, if you have a, an interesting idea, you have to be very patient. Eh? It sinks in after a while, so, and it comes back from a corner you wouldn't expect at all. Eh? So it turned out that this idea somehow stuck and people kept on debating it and actually the European Council that took it up in 1996 actually made an official decision that we shouldn't go beyond the two degrees. In the end what you learn is a good political target has to be extremely simple, extremely simple. But as Albert Einstein said, a good theory has to be as simple as possible, but not simpler. <laughs> it's very important. Eh? One of the great uh, aphorisms of Albert Einstein, and that's precisely what the two degrees are. It is as simple as possible, but not simpler. It still is a very important benchmark. And Sheldon Huber has a metaphor that he likes to use for those who think that two degrees or five degrees doesn't actually sound like that much warming you need to compare the Earth system with the human body. That is the most compelling metaphor. It took a thousand years until we understood how the human body works, you know, the blood system, everything. And in a sense, we now learn within 50 years how the Earth system operates. Huh? And it's very similar to the human body. You have elements which you just need to have. And so the two degrees come back in a sense, I said, well, what is global mean temperature? It is the result of thousands of processes, you know, you have the insulation, you transport heat away from the equator, you have the ocean circulation, thermal line circulation, Gulf Stream and so on. And in the end, global mean temperature is just fluctuating by hundreds of a degree over a year or so on. So it is like the internal body temperature. So your temperature, yours, mine, is probably 36.8 or something, unless we are ill. Eh? If you have fever, two degrees added to your body temperature means you are fairly seriously ill. At five degrees, and you are dead. And we've already passed a dangerous tipping point. Last year, NASA reported that the West Antarctic ice sheet had begun to melt irreversibly. Yes, we have already a West Antarctic irreversibility of about one meter sea level rise. Uh, the hope is that it will take a long time. Uh. I'm more concerned with Greenland, really, because Greenland, according to our work, the range where it will irreversibly collapse is between one and four degrees. The best guess is close to two degrees. Uh. And what, what would that represent if we pass that tipping point? It would mean seven meter sea level rise eh, and a complete reorganization of thermal line circulation, ocean currents, and so on. I mean, this would really change the face of the northern hemisphere. Eh? So, that would be the biggest near accident we, we may face. So, you see, even holding the two degrees line is a big gamble with the planet. Eh? And that is the scary thing, really. So the two degrees cluster is really the worrying one, no? because it means even if we can stop global warming at that level, we may have some big hits. Uh, uh, but the jury is still out on that. Uh, but it will be a very, very close run thing in the end. I think, I think what's often lost in, in the conversations about climate change, and then I think is maybe missing in the, the wider public, is that mm -hmm. The sense of we're not just talking about degrees like we're talking about degrees but what we're really talking about is a fundamental shift of how we live on this planet and the livability of life on this planet do you think do you think that 
we're getting that sense yet, like of, of just what is at stake. You've compared it to Russian roulette, a, a game we're playing here. <laughs> I even called it American roulette. Uh, American roulette is an invention of myself. It means you have not only one bullet in a revolver, a six shooter, but you have five bullets. And when you turn the chamber and when you put it at your head, I mean, it would be a five in six chance to kill yourself. Uh, and are we playing that game? Over many years, I thought we are really playing American roulette. Uh, I feel that this year we are shifting to Russian roulette, <laughs> which is not really a comforting idea, but it's still better than American roulette. Okay, you talked about the lifestyle, and I think in the end, this is the question, what is a good life? Uh, what do we want to achieve while we live 50 or 60 or 80 years on, on Earth? Uh, I mean. What type of experiences do we want to make? What do we want to share with other people? Huh? And I think it has gone really wrong. Uh, I mean, the fossil fuels have propelled us into the industrial age. Industrial revolution was very good for humankind. Huh? We have modern science and medicine and transport and everything, but it has gone too far, really. Huh? I mean, we are overdeveloped now. Not in Bangladesh, of course, eh? but my God, in the United States, in Canada, in Germany, we are overdeveloped. Eh? We have much more re material resources than we need to lead a good life. Eh? So we need to transform this, and this will mean, ultimately, we have to decarbonize the world. And so what, what do you think that will look like? I mean, can you talk about the, the scale of the transformation that, that needs to take place if we're to avert Dis disaster? Actually, I call it the Great Transformation. It means more or less moving from a wasteful, exponentially growing civilization to a circular economy. And this means, in the first place, to replace fossil fuels by renewables and reduce energy consumption, because we do not need so much energy as we use now. It means, second, that we have to close many material loops. So cradle to cradle principles might be useful, huh, where you do not just produce something and when you throw it away. And I mean, I once saw in, 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 in London a very nice advert saying, don't throw anything away. There is no way, <laughs> but it's true. Huh? <laughs> there is no way. It always comes back somehow, like the plastic garbage in the oceans. Huh? And the third thing is, if you throw something away, if you cannot reuse it, you have to make it absolutely degradable, biodegradable. Huh? I mean, it's absolutely crazy what we're doing. So the great transformation to sustainability, in my view, is the third big revolution in human civilization, the first one was the Neolithic Revolution, you know, when people settled down and invented agriculture. The second was discovering the use of fossil fuels, which all started in Lancashire in England in the 18th century. And now it's the transformation, the sustainability revolution, if you like, which would mean the human enterprise is finally settled in a circular way which, by the way, does not mean there is no growth, but the growth will be more intellectual growth. We will maybe all become creative people and not just take pride in driving an even bigger car every year. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah? I think the human enterprise has just gone wrong. I, I also heard you mention you can envision a future where if we somehow manage to keep it below two degrees, that there's actually a world with more cooperation. If we go beyond a certain point, uh, like four degrees, I mean, which we're on track to do, you can imagine a very scary, scary world. I mean, what, what do you see when you look at these divergent futures uh, in front of us? If we manage to keep global warming below two degrees, it means tremendous international collaboration uh, at a level unprecedented, really. So it would improve the human enterprise. If we go in a four degrees world, it would be everybody would fight against each other, right? It would be no world of peace anymore. We would more or less sacrifice everything we have. And why is that? I mean, the latest projection of the United Nations are 11 billion people by the end of this century, 4 billion of them living in Africa. Now, I have been traveling across Africa many times. 
And even now, it's almost impossible due to corruption, uh, lacking infrastructure and so on, to feed uh, those one billion people who are there now. I simply cannot imagine if you add four degrees to global mean temperature and quadruple the population. I mean, how could you stabilize such a situation? It would be hell on earth. And in the best case, and I really say this deliberately, in the best case, these people would be allowed to migrate to Europe, uh, Asia, America, whatever. But we are already despairing if we are faced with 2 million refugees from Syria. So how could you manage 200 million or 2 billion? It's impossible to think about it. What's interesting about the climate problem, as opposed to, to maybe previous problems, is that all we need to do is nothing and everything changes. If we, we, if we do nothing, we will be living in a very, very different w world. And so we, we need radical change if, if we're going to stave off disaster. And I'm wondering if your views of how that change is going to be brought about have evolved over the past five or 10 years, especially because I was interested to see you say that uh, we need social movements in order to address this problem which I found interesting given that you've been uh, advising important people for, for so long. Have your views on how this change is going to be brought about, has that, has that evolved? I mean, of course, everybody hopefully learns. Even I am able to learn while I go and, and study. No, no, you, you must not actually think you have reached now a state of wisdom which is serving you for the, ne the rest of your life. So we learn every day and I have had my own individual evolution uh, in the course of the events of the last 20 years. I mean, first of all, you're right. I mean, Angela Merkel once said, don't think that nothing happens if nothing happens. So quite to the contrary, the choice we have is we either transform the world or we will be transformed by the world. And I think it's better if you're part of shaping the future instead of just being shaped in a maybe extremely unpleasant way. So. Why did I say this about the social movements? Well, what I learned is, on the one hand, as long as we have national governments and so on, you need a few enlightened leaders. It makes a difference whether you have a Nelson Mandela or maybe a Stalin after uh, in South Africa. So you would have terrible bloodshed or you would have a peaceful solution. It makes a difference whether you have an Abraham Lincoln when you have to deal with slavery or whatever. Uh, so a few enlightened leaders can make a huge difference. But what I also learned is that they have to ride on a wave of public support in the end. Uh, cannot do it against the population. And I also learned this that people like Angela Merkel, she has never actually faltered in her assessment of the climate problem. Uh, but after Fukushima, she was able actually to move with the German energy vendor. It would, ha would not have been possible before, actually. Yeah? Because the political support from the ground the was there? The sentiment was not there. Right? So I guess it's the two things that have to come together. So we have to help the politicians and they have to help us. I, I think I, I read a quote that you said to, to the youth, you can't let the politicians spoil your future. I, I, for, I forget the exact wording. but I said, you must not allow the politicians to take the responsibility for your own future out of your hands. I mean, you have to claim your own future. Right? You are responsible for your own future, but you have to de do it if you find them together with enlightened leaders and politicians. Right? So I guess... This combination of factors is extremely powerful. Uh, if you would live in a country, say, Russia now, I mean, even if you would organize a good civil society movement, it would probably fall flat because there are no institutions you can turn to. Uh, so that is the good thing about a democratic society. Uh, I mean, in principle, you have the institutions, you have the free media, you have... Uh, once in a while, a really good politician, eh? and then you can take advantage of that. But if the politicians do not feel there is a public support for it, uh, we will just give up eh? and turn to a different theme. Because in the end, they need to be successful. Eh? We will not be re-elected, not even by their own party. So a good political leader needs to just have the support of civil society and then they can do something that makes a difference in the end. 
I know you're, you're very inside, so maybe it's hard for you to gauge the sense in the overall public, but do you think the sense of urgency is starting to, to spread at that how much needs to be done? I mean, we're, we're really at a critical moment. We are at a critical moment. I mean, I have just come to the conclusion that um, people take a long time in order to take a threat seriously. And we had this uh, ups and downs, really, in 2007. Everybody was in favor of climate action based on Hurricane Katrina and a few other things. It was actually chic and cool to be a climate activist at that time. Huh? So, you know, DiCaprio and everybody and Julia Roberts and everybody there was sort of, it, it was just chic to do it at that time. And then next theme, not interesting anymore. Oh, and they are all alarmist and so on. I think we have come back to reality now. I do think after all these vagaries and and sort of uh, mistakes and errors and deviations, I think we finally have a solid understanding in the public of the climate risk. We still have the odd denial lists and so on and a few sort of conservative media people, but the overall level of support is extremely high and very stable. So I would say finally the world has come to understand the tremendous risk we face. And it will not be shattered or, or even violated uh, by, by tiny blips in the media and so on. I think all the denialist arguments have been played out. Uh, they have no Trumps up their sleeves anymore. And yet, if uh, a Republican wins the presidency, we can be almost guaranteed that it will be someone who doesn't believe that climate change is much of a problem. Yeah. Let me come to the singularity in human civilization, the Republican Party, a little bit later. Now, what I think for 95% or 98% of the world, it is clear that we have a choice. It's a, a clear-cut case now. You either just forget about the future and you do nothing and future generations will be transformed uh, by global change or we act now. I think the choice is absolutely clear now and it will not be weakened uh, or tainted by somebody else. Let's, on the Republican Party, I think this is a phenomenon of decadence. I mean, if a, a system becomes dysfunctional, and I guess the US political system is dysfunctional, uh, then strange things happen. And in particular, and that is a general systems theory, if a system is threatened from outside or by internal dysfunctionality, uh, the reaction in general is more of the same. Uh, it is not lean back and think about whether the whole system is wrong, but they say, oh, we haven't done the things we should do as intensively as we should do when and not the system. The idea is to double down instead of to it's question the, anything. The wonderful thing, you know, if you are in a deep hole, stop digging, but the systems keep digging eh? and they go even deeper. Eh? And that is precisely what happens, what happened in antiquity several times to big empires and so on. And I think this is a sort of last stage empire phenomenon in the United States. Eh? If Donald Trump will be nominated, I don't think so, but should he really become nominated by the Republican Party, it would simply mean the system is close to collapse. Eh? And I don't think the Republican Party will win a majority of voters eh, if we would go down that way. I think in the end, uh, the majority of voters will make a rational choice. Eh? But you know, the global warming thing is bigger than the United States of America. If the world has to be transformed for the sake of a better future for our descendants, it will also be transformed without the United States eh? and without Canada and without Australia. The major population of this world is living in Asia and some of them and many will live in Africa. And for the United States, in the end, it's only the choice, would you like to be on the bandwagon 
or out of the bandwagon. And I, I would bet all my money that Donald Trump is not becoming president of the United States. <laughs> I'm wondering what it's like for you personally to be basically dealing in a business of uh, talking about the apocalypse to with your with your work and and advising people i mean you you talk to important people both in business and the public sector about basically the apocalypse what will happen if we do do nothing what is that like for you personally it is uh if you like an unpleasant surprise in my life that i'm found myself in that role because i really was only driven by curiosity as a scientist uh, and uh, and uh, the funny thing is in a sense, what I do, the type of science we do at the Potsdam Institute and my colleagues all over the world, is, as I said, fascinating science. Yeah? In a sense, we are in a situation like the people in the early days of quantum mechanics and relativity theory. Yeah? We are discovering how planet Earth is working. So that is very gratifying, yeah? and you can make a scientific career by that and so on. At the same time, the price tag is, of course, that this knowledge about how the Earth works, the planetary machinery, comes with a huge responsibility. Yeah? And this, well, I couldn't foresee this really. When I started uh, 25 years ago to work on, on that problem, I thought we will have much more time. It is a big problem, but we can, not easily, but we will solve it in time. And when it turned out, nothing happened. Yeah? We have the Kyoto Protocol, emissions go up, go up and so on. So we are now in this very dire situation. So I'm not talking about the apocalypse or whatever. I'm just saying we are risking to run down the human enterprise. Eh? And that's what it is. And if I would not speak out about it, who probably know more than 99.99% of the human population, who else should speak out about it? Eh? It's my job to do it, really. I mean, you cannot just say, I know what the Greenland ice sheet will melt down, but I will tell nobody. <laughs> I may publish it in, a, in an obscure journal, eh? but otherwise I will not tell anybody about it. I mean, it, but it would be ridiculous. Eh? You mean you shouldn't be neutral about the end of the world? I mean, uh, I am just doing the obvious thing. Eh? And it so happened that I'm sitting here and know more about the potential end of the world than most other people on earth. And you could see this, uh, could say, bad luck for me, maybe, but it's also good luck because maybe I can also make a contribution. I mean, if in the end I make a tiny contribution to saving the planet, uh, when I can even be proud of myself uh, at the end of the day. So I have a good chance. <laughs> well, to, to end off, you know, we're in a very critical moment. We have the meeting in Paris coming up within two months. It's, you know, we have the Pope uh, speaking out. We have the divestment movement growing. When you look forward, what are you looking out for? What are your hopes? What are your fears as, as we look forward to, to what's coming up? I'm pretty optimistic. We are entertaining here at the Potsdam Institute together with a few other institutions, the so-called Climate Action Tracker. Uh, just look at the INDCs, uh, the pledges and so on, and sum them up and say, what is the outcome? Uh, by 2100, what is the global warming? And you know, two days ago, for the first time, we have seen the two, namely now the, the, the middle of the road expectation is 2.7 degrees warming. You mean given all the uh, commitments? All the pledges, uh, give them all the commitments. Uh, and this is a major change from about four degrees, uh, which we had before. So I think if we can aim for 2.7, given the current pledges, we will also be able to raise the ambition and bring global warming below two degrees. Huh? So it's, it's like, I mean, you want to lose weight and you see on the uh, on the scale actually uh, still it's 90 and something and for the first time the eight appears uh, and say oh i'm on the right <laughs> course and that's precisely what is happening now i'm i'm optimistic really it all seems impossible until it happens uh, precisely what mandela said famously yeah it all seems impossible until it's done and we get it done well thanks so much for your work and thanks for joining me today yeah, you're welcome.
that's all for The Elephant this week. Special thanks to Mervyn Deganos, who helped edit and make this episode. The Elephant is made by myself, Kevin Caners, along with Matthias Gutz and Christina Peters. You can find us online, elephantpodcast.org, or say hi on Twitter. Our handle is at elephantpodcast. We're provided support by the CKAA, a European society of entrepreneurs, scientists, students, professionals, and policy officers working to create a climate resilient society. Find out more at ckaa.eu. I'm Kevin Caners. See you in two weeks' time. <laughs>